I want to welcome all of you for joining us and welcome Allie Mathis, who is the lead organizer for Justice Unite Savannah Together. It's a wonderful organization she's going to talk about. We are one of the founding congregations, and so she's going to talk about what the organization does, what we're doing now, and uh, take any questions. And we have a few people here like Kara and Jonathan who've done a lot with the organization, and they may have some things they want to add as well. So without further ado, Allie. Uh, this was a little lean. Right Are you sure? Yes. Okay. Thank you. She is not Jewish. She is not Jewish, just to let you know. Because it's a fast I agree. <laughs> I didn't wear leather shoes, though, so I did, did some homework. <laughs> Well, thank you again, Rabbi, for having me. I love coming and speaking about the organization whenever I can, um, especially like Rabbi said, because this is one of the congregations that founded this organization in 2020. Rabbi Haas was a major key leader that helped push this organization to form. Um, and if you haven't heard about just yet, I will be sure to go over everything. So hopefully you don't have any questions, but like he said at the end, um, I will answer some questions for you. So like he said, Justice Unites Savannah Together, or we also go by JUST, it's an acronym, um, was founded in 2020. And we currently have 22 member congregations throughout the Savannah area. It is an interfaith organization, so um, we have several houses of worship involved between Christian, Jewish, Muslim, and we actually just had our first two Buddhists involved in our listening sessions as well. So I'm very excited that we're growing um, diversely as well. Um, so I'm gonna go a little bit into the inspiration of our work because it is biblical. So we consider one scripture in particular that we base all of our work off of. Um, and in the Hebrew Bible, it's Micah 6 and 8, and it says, And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God? Um, so when we look at these three requirements that is so clearly laid out in front of us of what, you know, God requires us to do, we look at faithfulness, mercy, and justice separately. And our faithfulness ministry... Um, we do a pretty good job at, right? Those are the activities that we do usually weekly that encourages our walk with God, um, like coming to services. Um, mercy ministry, we also usually tend to do a pretty good job at because it's kind of like that instant need to help people, right? We do a good job of feeding the hungry, making sure homeless have, you know, a, a st place to stay at night, um, backpack putty, back pack buddies is a system or a, an organization in the schools where um, people can do as well for mercy ministry right and we like i said we tend to do a good job but justice is a little bit differently because justice biblically um, is holding accountable the king and other decision officials for the fair treatment of all people right so when we look at justice today that would mean holding our mayor our city council school board business leaders um, others that have power we hold them accountable for justice for the fair treatment of all people and that can be pretty hard to do um, individually right because you and i don't have enough power as individuals to go to the mayor's office and say hey mayor um, you know there's 21,000 families right now in Savannah that are cost burden and paying more than half of their income on rent. You know, we need more affordable rental units. If I just went in there by myself, he would say, oh yeah, you know, we know that there's a housing problem and kind of just brush me away. So our work, um, so justice, we don't tend to do very well alone because, or we, we don't do very well because we can't do it alone. Um, we need power to deal with powerful systems. And in our society, power comes from two sources, either organized money or organized people. And unfortunately, I do not have a lot of organized money, so I engulf myself with other people of faith to organize large amounts of organized people to hold um, our officials accountable for fair practices. And we do that successfully by looking, um, again, biblically, um, towards Nehemiah in chapter 5. Um, so Nehemiah is the cupbearer to the king of Persia, and he goes back to his homeland, Jerusalem, to restore the wall that um, had fallen. 
And because of a drought, crops failed and people were forced to borrow money to buy food and pay their taxes. And when the drought continued again for a second year, they couldn't repay back the money lenders. So what did the money lenders do? They took everything away from them. They took their vineyards, their orchards, and they were even forced to sell their children into slavery just to repay back these loans that they were given. Um, so when Nehemiah goes back to Jerusalem and he hears these outcries, he gets angry. And he decides that there's two things that he can do. He could do mercy ministry by opening a food pantry or doing credit counseling, right, to help people get back on track. Or he could actually do, you know, something tangible. And he held a great assembly um, where he brought the money lenders and the whole town before it. And at that great assembly, um, he asked and pressed the money lenders to restore and give everything back, and they actually did. So that is our inspiration of our Nehemiah action, is through Nehemiah. Um, so to do justice, we must be like Nehemiah, and we must build our capacity of our organization to um, organize a great assembly of people here in Savannah. So. That is kind of our inspiration. Now I'm going to talk about what is it that we actually do. So every year we share stories and values through a series of listening sessions that are led by local congregation leaders. Um, and we have several here at Mikvah Israel. So Rabbi Haas, Kara Bryant, Jonathan Rabb, Bruce Walker, um, Leslie Westmoreland. I always mess up her last name. Uh, Tony Lembeck, they're all our just leaders at this congregation, um, and they've all been trained to lead these small conversations. So if you get invited to one of these small conversations by one of these people, I highly encourage you to attend. Um, but these themes emerge um, through these small sessions, and then later on we gather to democratically select specific priorities that we're going to work on for that year. Um, so just like I said, justice ministry team leaders from each congregation. So all 22 congregation leaders are trained on how to lead and host a sacred conversation. Um, that's what we call them. And they serve three primary purposes. So the first is to build and strengthen relationships within our own congregation. So uh, my favorite part about sacred conversations is just getting to know each other better. We might all say hi to each other once a week at service, but we don't really know what's going on in our lives until we provide a space to truly share about what's happening, right? Um, I love to use the example, if I saw a rabbi at the grocery store, I could have been having the worst day of my life, and he would have said, hey, Ali, how are you doing? And I would have said, I'm doing great, rabbi, thanks for asking, right? But really, in the back of my mind, I'm worried about rent, I'm worried about student loans, I'm worried about how I'm going to pay for whatever else, right? Those struggles that we all have on our minds that we don't usually share with other people. This is the space where we do share so we can stand in solidarity with each other and so that we can actually do something about it. Um, so then, you know, we also listen to our congregation about the struggles that we're currently experiencing. Um, and then the third purpose of these small group meetings is to build up our justice ministry network by asking people to commit to being network members um, because we know that the network members really are the driving force in this organization. We know that our power comes from our network members because they're the people that show up to our Nehemiah Action and the other assemblies, um, so they're very important. But after all of the congregations have completed their sacred conversations, we report back as a group and narrow down the topics to bring forward to our first big assembly of the year, which is called the Annual Assembly. This year it's going to be on October 30th at First Presbyterian Church. And we are actually going to be continuing the same two issues that we have been working on last year because we're just not yet done with the work that we had started. Um, which then leads me to talk about our second process, which is community-led research. So research committees are formed, um, and they deepen their understanding of the problems um, that are surfaced in our listening sessions by interviewing subject matter experts and, ana and analyzing data. I am not a housing expert. I am not an education expert. Um, most of the people on our research committees are also not experts. Maybe they were 
previously, but they're not currently. So we reach out to experts, right? We have research meetings with local officials, local experts in these fields, so we gather that information. Um, Last research season, both of our research committees were busy with research meetings. The education committee learned that in 2019, 67% of third graders failed the state reading test. So in 2019, before the pandemic, before kids were forced to learn online, only 30-ish percent of kids passed the state reading test. And I don't know about you, but that is heartbreaking to me. I don't have any kids, but I have nieces um, that I'm trying to get my sister and her family to move to Savannah. Um, and that scares me because I, I want them to have a good education no matter what school they go to in the public school system. Um, and then also we learned that um, although that the city manager did allocate $2 million from the general revenue funds to the Savannah Affordable Housing Fund, which was great, um, the lack of affordable rental housing in Savannah is still a great concern. And like I said earlier, there are 20,000 people um, that the city has already recognized as cost burden and are paying more than half of their income on rent, um, which is also a huge problem. Even if you aren't, you know, paying rent, you know, kids, um, young adults, I should say not kids, young adults that are entering the workforce are not able to buy a house. They're not able to afford the rising rent costs in the city, which forces people to move in with family members, um, forces people to live multi-families in a small building, um, which forces kids to move around school districts, and that also affects their learning. So affordable housing really is a problem that affects everyone, even if you don't realize it just yet. Um, so at the second assembly of the year, the rally, um, the organization will hear reports from the research committees and vote to approve the solutions that we want to see implemented in our community. So after the rally, just a few weeks later, is when we um, lay out our third process, which is the direct action. So every spring just brings together large numbers of people of faith to an event that I talked about earlier, which is called the Nehemiah Action. And this is the assembly where we ask our committed network members to come and bring three additional people with them. Um, testimonies are given as to, sh to show how the problems are affected and are, are impacting real people's lives here in Savannah. You know, they're not just statistics. Um, and then research solutions are presented and negotiations take place with local authorities. Its purpose is to demonstrate broad public support for proven solutions and get local officials to make commitments that will lead to system-wide improvements. The Nehemiah action, unfortunately, can be tense. Um, when we are asking for something to be changed, it means that we're not happy with how things currently are, and that inevitably causes tension. Um, and as people of faith, we don't seek tension, but it is our responsibility to lift up that tension in our community, especially the problems that our community is facing, and make sure that the people that have the power to do something about it can fix the problem. Because we rely on them, we vote for them to fix our problem, well, not all of our problems, but we vote for them to fix some of the problems in our community. Um, so the Nehemiah action is not a confrontation with a person, but rather a confrontation with the problem that we want solved. Um, so this past spring just brought together 425 people at First African Baptist Church and got commitments from our school board president to hire a new superintendent that will be committed to implementing a direct instruction reading teaching approach um, to the schools. We're meeting with Dr. Watts next week, so I'm excited and hopefully we'll have an update afterwards. Um, but our work just doesn't stop there, right? So even if the public officials agree to implement community change, we spend the next process monitoring the progress to ensure that the public officials are doing what they said that they would do, right? So if they just told 400 people that yes, they will do something, and then a week goes, two weeks or a month, and, and nothing happens, right? We have to be there to follow up with them to make sure that they do what they committed to do. 
Um, this is also the time of year where we raise money and we fundraise for our organization because we don't accept government money. We want to be able to work on the issues that we vote on. So we want to be completely self-reliant. So we fundraise as well. Um, this year actually was our first year fundraising from local corporations and companies in Savannah, and we have raised just um, a little at a little over ten thousand dollars from just two companies in Savannah. Um, Anthony DeBressany from Southern Cross Hospitality. So if you go to Collins Quarters, um, the owner of that restaurant invested five thousand dollars into our work this year, and then also President Matt Clements from End Market. He invested $5,000 into our work this year as well. So next year we'll be reaching out to more corporations for investments, but they see that the power that this organization has, they see what we are able to accomplish through this work. Um, and they know that this is something that will help their businesses too. Um, you know, people that are working at gas stations here in Savannah are usually those that are lower paid individuals and are mostly affected by the lack of affordable housing. And um, Matt Clements knew that, you know, we could get work done for his employees that he maybe not could have. So um, it's exciting to partner with other um, companies in Savannah and other big businesses as well. Um, so we just actually kicked off our, our fourth listening process. Um, like I talked about earlier, and this year we have a goal of completing 40 small group meetings, um, which will hopefully, I won't do all of the math, but hopefully that'll put us at having 800 people at our Nehemiah action this spring, um, because we know with even more people, more power we have, and more actual solutions we can win for our community. Um, so the Affordable Housing Committee and Reading and Public Schools Committee have both reported, like I said earlier, that they're continuing this year. Um, and like I said, they're already actually starting research meetings because we already have narrowed down the two focuses. So if you're interested in joining either one of those committees or being involved more in this organization, I highly encourage you to reach out to Rabbi Haas, myself, or any of the other leaders that I talked about earlier. Um, and our first assembly of the year is, like I said, going to be on October 30th at First Presbyterian. Um, we will hear testimonies from community members that are experiencing challenges with affordable housing and reading. And we're actually going to be using this assembly as a city council candidates forum as well, since it is an election year for city council. So we are inviting everybody that is running for city council to come to this meeting, hear about what we are concerned about, especially with affordable housing. And then we will allow each candidate to give maybe two minutes to address, you know, if they were elected on city council, how they would address this problem. Um, so if you are not an early voter, uh, save your vote <laughs> until after you hear from our city councils at our candidates forum, because I'm excited and hopefully we'll be able to identify, you know, new housing um, allies that will help us get what we need for our community members for in terms of housing, which really is more rental units for people that are paying more than half of their income on rent. So that is a really quick um, overview of our organization. Um, I'm all over the place. My office is at Connection United Methodist Church off of Skidaway and Duran, but I come to congregations like this all of the time. I'm out and about in Savannah, so if you ever see me, say hi, um, or if you ever see me here, say hi.